Oh, no. I mean, definitely 9-11, like everyone, kind of uh, changed everything. Uh, and in part because the reaction was like so uh, ill-considered, right? That, that we, we went from uh, a, a crisis that um, showed that there were some weaknesses in the way that we managed security and also weaknesses in the way that we managed foreign policy and so we introduced a lot more weaknesses in the way we manage security and a lot more weaknesses in the way we manage foreign policy, right? Like, like um, you know, doubling down on, on bad policies. And so I had been working for a civil liberties group uh, for the Electronic Frontier Foundation and directly involved in the uh, uh, fights over mass surveillance and other uh, questions that arose after 9-11. And so that really inspired Little Brother. In particular, in 2005, an AT&T engineer named Mark Klein walked into our offices, which were then in the mission in San Francisco, uh, with a bunch of papers. And he said, you know, my bosses made me build a secret room for what I think was probably the NSA at our Folsom Street Switching Center and put a beam splitter in our main fiber trunk. And they've been intercepting all of America's internet traffic without a warrant. And we started to sue the U.S. government. And um, that lawsuit's still underway. It's called Juul. And, uh, you know, this was big news for a while, and then it faded. Um, a young senator named Barack Obama uh, killed the bill that would have made the phone companies responsible for illegal spying. He granted them retroactive immunity, but promised to rein in mass surveillance when he took office. And instead, he doubled and tripled down on mass surveillance while he was in office. Um, and the, as all this was swirling around, and as I learned that it didn't matter what your political affiliation was, that everybody was on the side of mass surveillance, uh, the idea of writing a book that tried to explain to young people what was disappearing around them, the, the right to have a life where you weren't scrutinized all the time, that that was a, an increasingly urgent mission, especially since in the ecosystem of mass surveillance, kids are one of the kind of beta testers of our worst ideas. You know, immigrants, kids, prisoners, mental patients, they're kind of the first line. And if it works on them, then we bring it to blue collar workers and then, uh, or maybe for, maybe then we bring it to benefit, people on public benefits, people on public assistance, then blue collar workers, and then white collar workers, and then everybody. And that's certainly the adoption curve we've seen. And so it seemed to me that directly speaking to young people about the creeping incursion of digital surveillance through the tools that you were using to remain in contact with people around you, to, to carry on your social and, and personal life uh, so that your choices were stop having a social and personal life or be surveilled, that that would be a, a particularly compelling message. That's the message that then Marcus Yellow, the lead character in the book, mm -hmm. delivers. Talk about his role, particularly as you see him fight against the police state, as you describe it, the work of Homeland Security, as you describe it, what's his role? So he's this, you know, 17-year-old overheated computer kid who loves computers and has watched all the YouTube videos and read all the how-tos and so on. And what he realizes when the DHS turns his city into a police state, he has this kind of string of realizations. The first is after he's taken away and, and subjected to uh, what amounts to torture because they believe he might be complicit because he refuses to um, uh, answer questions without a lawyer present and they treat that as an admission of guilt, uh, is he realizes on the one hand that things are terrible. And then he also realizes that his city has been hit by a terrorist attack and yet the stuff that they're doing to prevent the next terrorist attack is junk science that an actual terrorist wouldn't struggle to defeat. And then he realizes that if a terrorist wouldn't struggle to defeat it, then it's not gonna be hard for him either. And so he organizes a kind of children's crusade against mass surveillance. Um, they use common off-the-shelf anti-surveillance tools, the kinds of stuff that they've been getting uh, good at using to get away from the surveillance in their schools, and schools have increasingly become a locus of digital surveillance. And they just scale it up to be safe from the state. Uh, when it comes to then the writing about Homeland Security, what you're thinking about the real life homeland security in relation to what you wrote about them in the book? Well, I think that uh, we have a problem in that the mission of uh, the digital side of homeland security, particularly the NSA, is uh, in fact two missions that are at odds with one another. So on the one hand, the NSA is charged with keeping us digitally safe. 
right? keeping us from being attacked by criminals, by state actors, by um, you know, sociopaths, stalkers, griefers, and so on. And on the other hand, they're charged with attacking other states and domestic enemies uh, by surveilling them through computers and networks. And these missions are incompatible with each other. Uh, there is only one kind of computer that we use, and only one internet that we use, and only one set of operating systems that we use. There are not operating systems that good guys use and operating systems that bad guys use. So anything that the NSA does to create or, or uh, discover and preserve weaknesses in our digital tools creates and preserves digital weaknesses in tools that we rely on for our most intimate and urgent needs. Right? The, the internet is the single network through which flows free speech, a free press, freedom of association, access to education, employment, uh, civic and political engagement, and so on. And they can't do both of those things. And they have consistently opted for an offensive mission at the expense of the defensive mission. And we can see that. We can see that, for example, when our hospitals start getting seized by uh, blackmailers who use ransomware to shut down all of the systems in, in hospitals and then ask for paltry sums to unlock the hospitals. You know, the ransomware hackers who are stealing hospitals around the world, they're asking for about $300 to unsteal the hospital, to give the hospital mm -hmm. back because they weren't supervillains, they were dum-dums. And what the NSA has done is they've preserved a space in which dum-dums, the equivalent of the junkie who smashes your window to grab the quarter you laugh, left on your dashboard, can steal a whole hospital. And they've done that because they wanted to make sure that vulnerabilities in common computer systems were not patched so that they could use them to attack their adversaries. And in fact, the ransomware that was used to steal those hospitals, it used a leaked NSA cyber weapon to as its payload. And so this is literally the work of the NSA. And I think that there's probably no issue as urgent right now as making our digital systems work. Not because digital systems are more important than the climate or inequality or racial injustice or gender injustice, but because every one of those fights will be won or lost using our digital tools. And the fact that the NSA has proved itself so incapable of securing our systems because it is so wed to the idea of maintaining the insecurity of those systems is an existential crisis in and of itself.